Yet one out of every 12 people believes they've had a close encounter with a UFO. But no one has claimed to ever have first-hand experience with extraterrestrial craft. Until now. Bob Lazar is a former government scientist who claims he was hired by the military to back-engineer the propulsion system of an extraterrestrial craft. In what may be one of the most revealing interviews ever filmed, Lazar candidly discusses his classified work at the top secret research facility, S4. I was hired uh, to replace one of a couple people that were killed uh, while working on one of the reactors from one of the crafts. Apparently they, for whatever reason, cut open an operating reactor and the device exploded, killing both of them. The S-4 facility is an area just off the Papoose Lake bed, dry lake bed. It consists of nine hangars. The hangars have uh, sloped doors on them with a sand texture coating. The first disc I saw, I believe it was the second or I think it was the third time I was up there. Upon seeing it, it, it struck me that, well, this explains all the UFO sightings. Not thinking that it was an extraterrestrial craft, that this must have been some advanced form of fighter that we've been working on for years, and, you know, people have just caught it being tested, so on and so forth. And uh, it never even occurred to me, even though I was looking at an extraterrestrial vehicle, that, you know, this wasn't man-made. I only witnessed one test flight up close, officially. Uh, that I was in, just inside the hangar. It was a, a low performance test. The craft lifted off the ground, uh, virtually noiseless, other than a small corona discharge on the bottom of the craft, indicating the presence of high voltage. Uh, that dissipated at about 30 feet, and it stood there completely silently and moved over to the left and to the right and sat back down. That was the entire uh, test. It probably really hit me when I got inside the craft and looked around and began to understand how the craft was operated and finally grasped the whole project as a whole as what we were doing the fact that we weren't building this thing we were trying to find out how it was made we were back engineering it as early as the 1950s the government publicly acknowledged they were researching the UFO phenomenon in order to gain a technological advantage. A squad of 20 fully equipped Marines board the flying saucer. A preview of what may be the all-purpose vehicle of the future. I give everything nicknames there. The one I worked on was kind of sleek looking and I gave it the name the sport model. Um, there was one that looked like a jello mold. There was one that looked like a top hat. Extraterrestrial craft like the ones Lazar witnessed at S4 have been filmed and photographed around the world. In 1991, this footage made worldwide headlines. These two discs were videotaped in a suburb outside Ottawa, Canada. Both UFOs landed in a vacant field across from the photographer's house. This videotape became known as the Guardian footage. Again in 1991, screaming eyewitnesses prompted a tourist to take this picture from Manhattan Island in New York. The disc emerged from the river and quickly flew off. Another craft was photographed rising out of the water in Australia. Before it flew away, it docked with a smaller, dark UFO. A similar dark object was photographed in Denver. Startled eyewitnesses snapped this picture from a neighbor's backyard. In Peru, a hiker took this photograph of two discs as they hovered overhead for several minutes. Lazar's classified work at S-4 allowed him to closely study the extraterrestrial craft. I had to hang upside down in there to see the lower, uh, the lower level, essentially. And there were three large gravity amplifiers. These devices looked like about a two-foot diameter, four-foot long piece of pipe hanging by a smaller piece of pipe from the level above, and they can be independently positioned and that's what, what emits the gravitational waves that propel the craft. They'll use one gravity generator to lift the craft off the ground. And as opposed to what we're used to, for instance, a plane, once it's in the air, we envision thrust or some force coming out the back of it to push it forward. The crafts work completely opposite of that. What they do 
is once they're hovering in the air, they'll swing the gravity, two remaining gravity generators up in front of them and create a distortion, essentially a downhill. And the craft rolls downhill for infinity. It's always chasing a little distortion. Unidentified craft have been filmed and photographed flying around the world in radically different positions. Lazar explains. Essentially, the craft will tilt up on its side, focus the three gravity generators to a single point, and move through space that way. Lazar helps explain why UFOs have been videotaped, flying in seemingly erratic patterns. Moving around a source of gravity is a problem to a disk because it's interference, essentially. That's why they look goofy when they fly around at low speed. The gravity field around the Earth is not completely constant and stable, depending on the minerals and density of the earth underneath it, the gravity will vary somewhat and you will get odd movements of the craft. So its low speed mode is, is kind of unstable for the most part. In 1978, this UFO footage was taken by a New Zealand film crew. When the footage was enhanced, the craft appeared to have two portals and a rim around the center. The object was moving at such high speed it left this track on a single frame of film. Photographic analysis revealed the craft was moving at 6,000 miles per hour. No conventional aircraft can maneuver at this speed. Just because you can visually see, either with the eye or on radar, a craft moving at 7,000 miles an hour and making a 90 degree turn, doesn't mean that's what's happening. Don't forget, again, that the craft is distorting space and time, so your eyes are fooling you. I mean, the craft does not necessarily have to be moving like that. People wonder how a craft like this can make a turn at such high speed, a 90 degree turn, when they would imagine people slamming up against the wall or something to that effect. Well, that, that really wouldn't happen. Inertia would have no effect. Uh, you're, you're in a distortion. And don't forget that gravity distorts time and space. So really nothing is going to influence you while you're in there. One thing most close encounters have in common is light. UFO sightings usually appear as lights in the sky, or the craft appears to glow. Lazar explains this aspect of the phenomena. If you were going to see one of these crafts at night operating, it would appear really as a glowing ball or a, just a bright light in the sky from a distance. Uh, even close up, you know, you'd see a, a glowing halo around it. What you're dealing with with as a high energy source in essentially a gas atmosphere, oxygen, nitrogen. And uh, when you apply enough energy to a gas molecule, they emit photons, they emit light. It's a, really a byproduct of how the craft operates. When it's a, emitting that much energy, the gas surrounding the craft emits light, the same reason why lightning is visible. You have a huge electrical discharge and the gas emits light in the form of lightning. Obviously, the ET craft do exist. Something had to build them, so there must be aliens. And since there are and the craft are there, there must be some sort of factory and an entire civilization somewhere. And if, in fact, that is true, and it apparently is, then there must be others.